So let's give a big round of applause to everyone that came on stage. Uh, let's have each of you introduce yourselves and say your parts, I guess, and your year at Eastern or your role at Eastern. All right, my, my name oh. is Cody Gray. Uh, I played Rodolfo, and I'm a post path theater leader. My name is Chris Hansen. I played Marco, and I'm a junior in the theater and arts program. Jeff Sanders. I play Eddie Carbone. I am a lecturer in theater here. I'm Sarah Goff. I play Beatrice, and I am a professor of theater here. Hello, I'm Aaron Taylor. I play the second immigration officer. I'm a senior, double major in business and theater. And I, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, my name is Tico Dumoulin, and I was the stage manager for the show. I am a senior theater major. My name is Nicole. I played Catherine, and I'm graduating this spring, and I'm very, very excited. <laughs> Wait, what major are you? Theater. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm Emma King. I play Mrs. Lapari. I'm a sophomore double major theater in biology. I am Dobby Bullis. Jesus. Um, I play first immigration officer, and I'm a senior theater major. <laughs> My name's Eli Drusella, and I play submarine number one, and I'm a junior <laughs> theater major. Chris Mudd, Lewis, <laughs> junior film major. Also, hello. So, just to let everybody know in Let's Energy uh, how this works, we basically just have an open forum to ask the cast and crew whatever we want to know, um, whether that has to do with the actual production, the interpretation of the play, uh, the choices the director made, even though he's not here. Um, you know, we talked to him on Wednesday, so we can ask the actors their opinion or uh, how they interpreted it. Um, whatever you want to ask, you can feel free to ask, and it'll just be kind of an open forum. But uh, before we start that, I just have to say that this play was phenomenal, you guys. It was amazing. I mean, I really was impressed with it, and I'm sure that anybody who saw it here felt the same way. So, uh, kudos. Um, questions? How long have you been here? Yeah, uh, we oh, I turned it on. Oh, sorry. Okay. we started um, rehearsals on um, April 28th. Yeah. Four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah. And we rehearse about six days a week from seven to eleven. Nice. That's unusual. Yeah. Our, our normal uh, rehearsal process, usually the shortest rehearsal process that we do is uh, six weeks in the spring. So doing a, a four week production is, is pretty rare for us and it was, it was really cool. Uh, do you think that um, comparison into you know, having six weeks to prepare and four weeks to prepare, does that make much big of a difference? The question is, what's the difference um, in a four-week rehearsal process as opposed to a six-week uh, rehearsal process? Um, I think that um, the preparation going into it um, is different for an actor. I mean, I was intentional about trying to um, memorize my lines or at least start that process. Um, and part of that also is because we have jobs <laughs> so there's a lot of things, as I know you can all relate to, going on, you know, especially this time of year. So you you have to be really disciplined about your time. So I would say that for myself, that was the major difference. Although I I don't um, I guess I haven't worked on these long rehearsal processes because this is the first time I've acted on stage here, which was a great pleasure. I normally direct. Uh, some of us up here had an interesting experience being in our senior capstone. Uh, literally a day before having the strike, the day before we started rehearsal. Um, and so a lot of us were, were working on a four week process of uh, Julius Caesar and having major lines uh, to memorize for that. And then we got our scripts and 
start at day one, we didn't really get the total luxury coming up and getting him like, you know, memorized early. And it goes with the jobs thing. That was our job at the time. So we had to go from one play directly to the other and straight in and change characters and get our minds out of things and get focused up really fast. Uh, what was it like having to do all the accents? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. I actually I was frustrated first because I I, I usually can learn lines or accents very fast, and this was one that didn't. And it was very frustrating at first, but it was it's all about taking everything that you do every day and breaking it apart and then setting it back up. So for me, it was plateau after plateau after plateau of Really digging in. Uh, with me, it was a lot of mark. You have to mark your script a lot, you know, because you can't expect the author to always give you how it sounds. So you have to mark up your script with pencil marks or inflection or adding an A after some words, you know, and, which you can hear sometimes. And and uh, like Cody said, breaking it down and then building it back up and then trying to speak it in your everyday life helps a lot too. Yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, you know, I started probably working on the Brooklyn dialect. Uh, in specific, New York is New York, but Brooklyn is something else. You know, um, yeah, in Brooklyn, 1950s at that. So you know, I started you know April, like April first, somewhere in there. April first, yeah. Um, <laughs> I had some dialects uh, CDs that I worked off of. Um, I watched some films. On the Waterfront was a big important film that I watched and studied. Um, and uh, then we brought in a dialect coach uh, as a guest artist. And, and he actually lives in Chicago. So we flew him in and he gave us a weekend intensive on how to be a Brooklyn, uh, on Brooklynese. And uh, I can't say everything because it involves a lot of cuss words, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, uh, so our warm up is we're like a bunch of sailors. You banger? Now come on now, <laughs> keep our secrets. <laughs> I it's something to say about that. Jeff talked, uh, or I think Chris talked about uh, putting it into like our our everyday life. Uh, one of my favorite things about this process was just during the day, uh, listening to Jeff walk around the halls and yell things in a Brooklyn accent at people. And teach in a Brooklyn and accent. Teach in a Brooklyn accent and things like that. It was it was it was really fun. <laughs> One of the fun experiences I had is when I after a long rehearsal, I would go home and order Jimmy John's, as I'm sure <laughs> you all have done many times. Um, and I would do it in my dialect because I think it's important to do it just doing everyday things, you know. Um, and every time I did it, because it's such a straightforward, uh, harsh dialect, uh, it brings a certain attitude to it, uh, that people think you're like yelling at them, <laughs> you know. And, and I would get on there, and I, and I wasn't intentionally trying to do so, I was just trying to be straightforward, you know. Um, and I'd order, I'd, order, I'd order, of course, the Italian club, you know. <laughs> whatever, it's the Italian night out or whatever. You know? and, uh, and I could tell the person in the line was like, kind of getting pissed with me. So like, it just was really like, I don't know, intimidated or whatever. And then the person coming to the door apparently could clearly had been told something about watch out for this guy. And I was like, oh, thanks, you know. <laughs> I gave her a good tip because I felt maybe, you know, I was a jerk. <laughs> Um, so Jeff, I know that like you taught my theater class and it was a lot of fun and you're a great professor and I was just wondering like how different and like which one do you like better being on stage or being a professor here? So the question to Jeff who teaches theater and humanities, a great class you should take it if you still need a get her. Um, <laughs> Uh, is what does he prefer to be on stage or in the classroom? My first love um, is acting, um, and so that's what changed my life. Um, but then, as I grew and matured as a person, um, I found that I, I was um, 
deriving as much satisfaction in my life from teaching someone else that same craft. Um, so they are not separable to me, and um, I, it's very difficult to weigh them because they are equal parts of each other. Does that make sense in some way? Um, so um, I love both those things highly equally, <laughs> and uh, would be quite a lost soul without either of them. You know, and you know my greatest accomplishments in my career that I consider are. Um, Nothing that I've ever really done, but helped someone else to achieve. So I think you know I'm in the right field of work. Um, although being on stage is very much um, a different kind of home too for me. So yeah. Uh, what were some of your favorite scenes from the play? Mm -hmm. Just in general. Yeah. For so the question is favorite scenes from the play. I really like to yell at Jeff a lot, so that part's great, because um, uh, the journey for Catherine is, it, it, I didn't even notice till yesterday that it's like physically was in my body, like because someone came up to me and said, I love how you shuffle your feet off the stage like a little girl, I'm like, yeah, I'm 17, and then I noticed yesterday that by the end of the play, I'm just walking, and I was like, oh my god, that's so much different, and that's uh, what I've noticed it the most, I came off stage after telling him, I, this is happening, and you can, they can't do anything about it. And I was like, oh, I'm, I am a woman. And it felt really great to, um, to actually not just have someone else say that it was happening, but to actually make the connection in my head to know that my character was doing that. But, um, and then having to hate him so much after at the beginning, loving him so much, was that was my favorite because it brought it all, my whole journey to a, a big explosion point. Um, so for us, it's really easy to you know, look at the play as a tragedy. And, we, well, some of us forgot, you know, there are funny parts of the play until we got to hear, like, the laughter from the audience on opening night. And so those little moments of lightness, like when Mike and Lewis come out hey. and they're talking, and, you know, and, I mean, they just have random stories and they're coming on stage, and I love those because it's just, it's the lightness in the play that really, you know, makes it flow well and makes it so up and down. And then also, you know, being a student here for two years and being taught by Sarah and Jeff, being able, any scene with them together, interacting with each other, because they're married in real life and they're married on stage. And so being able to see them interact with each other was just life changing because they're the ones who have taught me and you know, we're just learning from them and it's so much different than you know, seeing them on stage and seeing them in the classroom. So, I mean, yeah. Okay, so Mike and Lewis go out there in the laughing scene, that's really fun to do. As far as what scene I like to watch, um, spoilers, uh, the scene where there's a little bit of kissing going on, the, uh, <laughs> you can kind of feel the comedy edge of the play is completely gone at the end of that scene. And every night I'm backstage and I listen to the reaction of the audience and how they're like, ah, but I have to laugh a little. And then the second time they was a kiss, they're like, not so much this time. So that's a blasty blast. <laughs> yes. I'm done. <laughs> oh, Hanson's got something. <clears throat> Jump. Uh, I mean, for me, it's uh, and like like Emma said, it's always great to to now finally be a part of the craft that you're learning with those that are teaching you. Um, so anytime that I'm on stage with Jeff or, or Sarah, it's amazing, and the little interactions that our characters get that aren't voiced. Are a lot of fun, but uh, also you never get you know the opportunity to spit on your professor, so that's fun. Uh, uh, not that you deserve it or anything. Um, I had to tell you to do it. Yeah, you did. Because uh, at first I was like, oh, what? Like, really? Okay. So I mean, yeah, that was that was fun. Um, I think my favorite is the boxing scene um, and the journey that Marco goes through and uh, the little things that Eddie does to really kind of tick away at him. And uh, then you get this chance, Marco doesn't really know what he's gonna do, whether he's gonna hit him or not. And so then he decides to just imply to him and show him this is how this is gonna happen. And then that chair moment's a lot of fun. So. Practice, did you have to practice to do that? Not a lot, but I had to just get more and more chairs, just work my way up, and so then the one in the lobby is the one that I rehearsed with, so. 
Which you should pick up during intermission. Yeah, if you come see the show during intermission, go try and pick up the chair. Mm -hmm. See if you got what it takes. <laughs> I try every day. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I, I can't pick it up. What you see is what you get. That is my best effort. <laughs> so if you think, oh, he didn't act that well, it's like, well, there's no acting. So I just can't do it. So he's a very impressive young man. He has very large muscles. Very large. Funniest line from the play that your character had and say it in your accent. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, come on. Uh, he's like, I'm a stage manager. Um, I don't know. Uh, you got one? Yeah, he's like, you have to say it to Rodolfo. Rodolfo. Yeah. 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 any of your ones. Uh, uh, the last one in the first scene, I mean, I say, Sugar? Yes, I like a sugar very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's when, yeah, it's alright. <laughs> 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 it's spoiled. You get a lot of laughs. Yeah. Read this play, right? Yeah. I see all the scripts. Yeah. Yeah. So they know. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes. They all read it. I think the one yeah. that I like the most is uh, he sang it too loud. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like Groove. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. Yeah. Like a rice above the fish. Yeah. Rice above the fish. Yeah. With that wacky hair, it looks like a chorus girl or something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have <laughs> I love other people's lines, and I do love to say, you crazy or something? <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you saying? It's like a real There we go. Lewis has a continuous and feeble need to bowl. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep desire for his character. If you want every scene, I'm in my ass. I go bowling, and that's it. <laughs> Slightly weird, actually. We're going tonight. That's where the light yeah. of play comes from, really. At Rose's. Yes. Yeah. You can bowl with us at Rose's. Tonight. We're going bowling. Oh, yeah, tonight, yeah. after the show, we're bowling. Oh. Uh, so, some of you guys have, I've seen you in multiple Shakespeare plays, <laughs> and I'm sure you have been in others. But I was wondering if any of you have been in other Arthur Miller plays, and if you could compare the experiences, or been involved with them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so, uh, well, I I did uh, his play All My Sons um, in '04. So it's a long time ago, ten years ago. Um, and uh, I did uh, The Crucible um, in. Uh, <laughs> 95. <laughs> I was a sprightly Danforth. Um, <laughs> if you know that, that's fine. Um, so, um, and, and a view from the bridge. And so this is my third Miller. Um, I desperately would like to do more. I, I find his writing so compelling. Um, he gives you so much as an actor, he challenges you. What's so amazing is that all of his characters, um, you know, be from the bridge, the, you know, the language of be from the bridge, the language of the crucible, the language of all my sons are so vastly different. Um, you know, some playwrights all sound the same. You know, every character kind of sounds a little bit like, sorry, David Mann, or sounds a little bit like Neil LeBeau. But these characters are all so different. And um, this was the hardest show, though, in terms of memorization I've ever had in my life. And that's partly because of the Brooklynese and the, um, it didn't really follow normal syntax. I find Shakespeare 50 times easier to memorize. Um, and so even this show, I, I sit there and, I, and I, they would watch, and I don't know if this is because I'm getting older, but um, you know, I'd get in rehearsal and I'd have meltdowns <laughs> a little bit, you know, part, I'd always say to them, you know, sometimes Jeff wins, sometimes Eddie wins, and if Eddie wins, I sometimes beat myself up, and that was part of the process to get over that, but uh, I don't know how I got there. Yeah, three more. Yeah. How, how long did it take to get the, um, the cue so tight? Because, I mean, really with this play, and I mean a lot of Arthur, <coughs> of Arthur Miller plays, it's so much about like the relationship between the characters, and uh, we talked a little bit with Brad about you know what's not said, 
Um, but the cues are so tight conversationally, I felt like um, this was really, I mean, I, I went on opening night on Wednesday. Uh, sometimes opening night, you know, cues don't get picked up as quickly just yeah. because it's the first, you know, run, not run through, but first big show. So I was wondering, you know, how long it took to really get the, the quickness down. I mean, it's fast talking. It's definitely... Yeah. I mean, the... The, you're right in terms of the language style is, is not a, a very slow, methodical, it's, it's these people, yeah. you know, they, they think fast, they speak fast, they, they think big, react big, and immediately. They're very emotional. Um, that's partly what was a little more difficult for me to tap into because I'm a very kind of reserved person and, that, and my emotions are kind of, but Eddie's just all over the place on, on a switch. Um, in terms of the cues and keeping them tight, you know, um, <laughs> that's another challenge is you don't memorize your, just your lines, you have to memorize your cues. Um, and not only, and really, what, and really the next level to that is you don't really memorize your cues, you memorize what triggers your next thought, which is not always the cue, but, you know. Which, um, is, what, yeah. which is what's making the cueing kind of hard. Yeah. Because I'm getting triggered with a thought sometimes three sentences before the line is ended. And so that can help the acting when you're really listening, but then, you know, running over other people's text has been a little bit of an issue. It's been happening a lot. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I was going to say another part of that is like uh, knowing your cues <laughs> and knowing the thought that sets you off. Uh, in a way, for me, I always try and know, uh, like, paraphrase of the characters before me or my cues before me uh, because sometimes your cues can just become a look where somebody just needs to look at you and you need to go and those are in drastic moments that happen and you pick up and you run with it and sometimes you have to pick up for others what they missed so that's always fun because then you're on your toes and you're like all right what's next you know let's hope everybody else got what i was saying so yeah and that's, I think, I think some of the best moments in theater happen when people forget stuff, because <laughs> it, it puts all the actors on stage in a, in a way more electric situation. Uh, there's a, a lot of times we can kind of, if, we, if, if things are going so well and we know exactly what's going to happen next, we can kind of sit back into our characters and like, relax into a role. But watching what happens to people when, when just one person forgets a line and there's like a split second pause and maybe somebody else picks it up or maybe they pick up their line somewhere in the middle of it or something like that. Something unusual happens. The whole energy changes and everybody's suddenly very present because they know if something goes wrong, they're going to have to pick it up or have to cover for them in some way. And that's where we, we really get some really exceptional moments in the theater. Uh, I have kind of a two-parter. I can't remember exactly how many of you are all theater majors, but for ones that are, are you are you plans to go Broadway or if at all? I mean, acting-wise, <laughs> is plan to go Broadway, theater, or acting Hollywood, and why? Uh, I think there's a lot of answers. Good question. So, so I actually graduated in 2012 with a vocal performance degree, and at that point in time, I was really emphasizing an opera in musical theater. And so then coming back and doing this last year and, and doing more straight plays, I mean, I, I would really like to do a lot of musical theater. That's a good niche for me. I'm a tenor voice, a male, and, and those are kind of rare. And then just to be able to sing and act, it's, it's a good niche. And so Broadway would be probably something that I would want to really strive for. Uh, right now, can't say much totally, but um, I'm in both. So, my, uh, and I'm also a really fan of the technical side. Um, if you notice the programs, I was also part of the uh, carpenters for the set and uh, painting and stuff like that. I do a lot of scene painting and a lot of the brick that you see was me, which was nice. And um, it's, uh, I'm a double major of art, studio art, and then theater. So it's good for me to get both crafts into one. And then uh, I'm looking to, and yeah, I'm a really big fan of special effects and makeup. I do a lot of that. So it's, uh, I'm looking into both. So I too have done both. And that question is, is really hard uh, because so much of acting, like true acting, is involved 
starts in the theater. And that's really feel like that's really where I feel is kind of home for me. That's where that's where I feel like my most comfort and where I get my peace at in the theater. And so I would like to broaden my uh, career in acting eventually uh, going to the Broadway. Uh, but uh, right now I got grad school coming up with uh, business. So uh, acting uh, in the next few years is probably not going to be as much as what I, I would want to uh, with grad school. But I, I definitely am looking into doing both in the near, free, near future. So we'll see what happens. Um. I, uh, I, neither is the answer to your question from me. I don't, I don't want to do either of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like either of those cities as far as living somewhere. Um, but I think this is a, a common, uh, I guess, idea about theater majors that we kind of just do one of two things, either go to film or to Broadway. And I think it's important to say that there is a lot more that we do. Um, I am, in particular, a, a, a technician for the longest time. I do a lot of acting and, and stage management, and I did just directed my first show last for this quarter. Jesus, that's <laughs> still this quarter. Um, but I hope to move on and just be able to influence small communities by doing the artwork that I do by spreading the, uh, the idea that you can do this as an art form and make a living doing it anywhere you want to. Um, so whether that happens here or happens somewhere else, I just want to like, spread a consciousness of an art form that most people don't, I think, have a, a, a general understanding of in the first place. So I don't know where I'm going to end up, but uh, I'll be doing theater there. <laughs> So I am graduating, so I can share with you my plans that are happening. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in New York for a conference uh, with a company called ASTEP, and that stands for Artists Striving to End Poverty. Uh, so basically, I went through a huge journey with theater, and it followed me for a really long time, and I tried to avoid it, and I had like five other majors here. This is my fifth year. And um, it kept following me, so I, I found it. And then I almost ran away again because I was like, but I have to go save the world and do all the things and join the Peace Corps. And so I finally found a company, the ASTEP, that is the artist Peace Corps. So um, in September, I plan on going to India to um, ASTEP partners with a place called Teach India and a school called Shanti Bhavan. And they take theater into uh, communities where children are not empowered and they are in the lowest caste and they may not be, think that they can move up in the world at all because that's what their society is telling them and they empower those students through art to inspire themselves and their whole community around them. So I'm going to be involved with that a lot um, and other companies like that and that's mostly applied theater if you're interested in knowing what that is. Um, there's a lot of names for it but applied theater is the big umbrella term for what I want to do. Um, I probably will still act. Um, I don't know about Broadway and Hollywood. I also don't really enjoy those, the environment of the big cities, but I'm going to go to my New York for the first time, and maybe I'll love it and never come home. I doubt that. I'm going to India. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to go be a citizen of the world and take my art with me and, and save the children and stuff. <laughs> Um, so I am the only one in the department now that has a double major in both theater and science field, so it's a little different. Um, I like both, both subjects. Theater brings out the my fun side, but then I can also major in biology. Um, so with you asked, you know, theater and development, two goes with you know, there's not just acting on the stage or behind the screen or you know, behind the camera. Um, I do prefer the stage because it's different every night, you know. Um, it's, you know you don't get the same hobby, you can't rewatch the same thing ever. So that's you know something special. And you get the audience right there, you get to see the tears, you get to hear the laughter, which is something I love. Um, so yeah, so yeah, stage work and then um, yeah, yeah, theater. <laughs> I'm long winded, so I apologize for this. <clears throat> but um, I was originally a uh, secondary English education major with a minor in history. I was going to be a high school teacher, and that sounded like a boatload of fun. And then uh, I started reflecting on life, and I started thinking, what, 
what is it that I would be very upset that I didn't do if I was that? And I go, well, I love acting. I would be very upset if I didn't try to be an actor. And so that kind of vaulted me into this and go, ha, teaching math, and then <laughs> into theater. And my, my desire, I would love to work on Broadway or in Hollywood. I'd like to work in indie films or international films. Um, but I love the theater. But it was like, I was homeschooled for 14 years, and my mom's a very theatrical person. And literally, theater has been a part of my life my entire life, and integral to the way that I learn. Um, and so my, my desire is to just get better at the craft, continue to get better and better and better. And uh, I think one of the ways in which we measure history is by art. And the, the, the lack of uh, importance on a, a national level and even maybe a global level of art is appalling to me because it's, it's, it's so clearly important. And so I just want to put myself in a place where I can actually have some influence to, to show that. Like, look, look at this. This is important stuff. You know, it rips your heart out, and then it can raise you up. This is beautiful stuff. But that, that, that. <laughs> um, I don't have any clue what I want to do. <laughs> Um, I'm just not going to think about it until next year. <laughs> My real goal is to not be homeless. <laughs> but I would love to do both of them. Here you go. <laughs> How do you follow that? Self poetry. Uh, so there's been this sort of, I don't know if you know, or something, but there's been like this consistent, like, everyone on here has said the word art before. And I think the people that don't do artistic things traditionally, what's known as artistic things, are going like, to disconnect with that. But I think, you know, for me, as a film student, you know, I'm kind of going into it on a more directorial film side, which is a completely different medium. But acting as an art, I think the best directors know how to act and know how to talk to actors. And so that's kind of my approach. But um, for anyone who doesn't really do what's traditionally known as art, I think there might be a disconnect with what that really means, how to be an actor and how to do artistic things. Uh, and I think the easiest metaphor for me is that you know, some people like to cook or they like to do sports and be athletic. And so, you know, the field is someone's stage or the wrestling room is someone's stage. And there's this sort of zen when you're doing that that it's like, you know, this is what I want to do. And so any kind of venue that I'm able to really explore acting and directing and just sort of creating something with a group of people uh, is, is a beautiful thing. So uh, anyway, I can possibly do that either in LA or in New York or Chicago or New Orleans or anywhere. Uh, that's the plan. So bye. <laughs> Go, go. go on. <laughs> why? Why is your guys' theater so small? Like that was the first thing when when I went to when I went to the first play. My high school theater is probably about three times bigger than your theater. So does it mean better? Does it? No. No. Well, well, often, <laughs> yeah. Often I think smaller theater is better. It all seemed like kind of crunched together sometimes, and I was just wondering, like, is Eastern not that big on theatrics or? That's a really fascinating question. It is. I'm or sorry. response, at least. Perhaps Sarah can speak. Well, it's more opinion. Like, um, um, yeah, right. The reason is because we needed a new football field. There you go. Uh huh. Well, you, you know, I, I suppose uh, that's a really interesting thing. I've never really okay. thought about why our theater is the size that it is. Well, I mean, isn't your guys' high school theater bigger? Uh, my high school theater was much larger. It was like a thousand seat auditorium, but it wasn't a theater, it was an auditorium. Right. Uh, Ours is a, a theater that has a lot of, there's a lot of different things that are happening in that, in that space that happen in general in like a high school auditorium that inform the size of it. Um, it's much easier to do more technically with a smaller space. How so? Uh, well, if you have, okay, so our, the, the proscenium is like the box that you see through. Um, 
And so our proscenium width is 30 feet. So we can create a, a detailed set within that 30 foot space with a certain amount of money that might not, we might not be able to get so detailed if we had a larger space. My high school's, for example, was uh, I think 54 feet wide, almost twice the size of the stage that we work on now. And we had to work on a, on a much simpler, uh, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Scale? Not really scale that I'm looking for, though. It's a, a much simpler, like, uh, general outline for every show that we did. We couldn't say, okay, this time, like when we did Ode, there was beautiful wallpapering, and we had crown molding across the walls, and all of this very specific detail work that was put into building that set and making it come to life. So even though it might seem like a smaller space, it's, it provides us with the opportunity to go much more in depth with the work that we do. Also, I think that um, as far as actor relationships, it's much more interesting to me to see people be closer together. <laughs> um, I think relationships come to life uh, much more dramatically when there's less space to work within. Although we use the extremes of the space as far as being far apart and close together, those extremes become more dramatic when the space itself is smaller. Three ingredients uh, for theater. Um, it has nothing to do with the size of your auditorium. It's, um, ha, that's what she said, okay. Um, there's a performer, an audience, and an empty space. And what you choose to fill that space with, that, that, that's what you are as an artist. Um, and the great thing about the theater, no matter what size it is, whether it's a thousand seat or, you know, I've worked in much smaller houses than the one we are at right now, um, is you can't lie in the theater and get away. you cannot lie in the theater and get away with it. Because you, like Eddie Carbone at the end of this play, will be wholly known from to the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. There's nothing you can hide. Um, so, yeah, so whether you choose to bleed in a big space or a small space, it's still blood. And, uh, you're welcome to it. I can't follow that. How many of you been to the INB? Yeah, I went and saw Wicked there a while ago, but I had terrible seats. It was, yeah. <coughs> right? Especially, I think, when, you know, we're. Um, influenced by film, you know, where you have a camera that's zooming in and zooming out. But I really always want to be close. I'd love it just if they just spit all over me. <laughs> Please. You know, and I'm always so disappointed. And that's why if you go to New York, there's some bigger houses. I'm not going to say there's not, but um, most of the theaters are really small. And it is awesome. I was just gonna say something about being close. It's like it's a very intimate space, and uh, for someone like like me who comes from a lot of sports background, and I, I haven't really been in theater that long, um, it makes the comparison for me. It's like you know, if I was a lineman in high school, which I was, uh, very small, um, you can't lock someone that's like really really far away from you, you know, and, and make the play work. You know, if they're they're away from you, they're still gonna come in, you know, dodge it and get the tackle, but. If you're an actor, right, and you're trying to make somebody see your, your, your facial expression in the back of the house, and they're too far away, they're not going to get it. So when you're close to the audience, and you're close to your opponent, then you can make the play and make the play work. <laughs> so, yeah. That's what I think about small space. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've actually found myself able to kind of connect to the world of play a lot better because of the smaller space. I think um, the closer you are, the more present I feel uh, in this whole world of play. And that's why I think it's so cool, like even though our stage, yes, it, it may look like it's small, but I think where you are, you're very present in what's going on on stage. You're very present in these moments that are happening which I think really engages 
as an audience member, it engages you in just a, a fascinating way. And so I, I actually love the smaller space. It's, it's, it's very fascinating. Anything else? Other questions? I have directed a lot in class. Was it a relief to be acting? Was it more work, less work, or different, different work? Well, <laughs> <laughs> some of us uh, took the directing series underneath Sarah, so we had the opportunity to direct each other in the classes. And it was it's definitely a little different. Actually, it's not a little different. It's a lot different. <laughs> than actually performing. Uh, there's, there's so much more as a director that you really have to understand. You don't really just have to understand you know, what the characters are doing. You have to know what the play is, what's happening in these moments. You know, you're, you're, you know, Sarah mentioned us given circumstances and then maintaining the dramatic action of the play. There's so much that goes on in the director's head. I think it causes, your, I think it caused me to kind of be a little more paranoid because I, being putting myself in the director's seat was a lot more difficult than actually being a performer. When I'm performing, I'm, I'm putting on a character mask. When I'm in a director, it's, it's like I feel like I'm in charge of everything. And you pretty much are. It, you're, you're pretty much running the entire thing. Um, I had a, a really awesome experience this last year of uh, playing the lead in a show, directing a show, and then stage managing a show. Like three in a row, back to back. And um, I, I think that every single time I do something new in the theater or even work on a new show, it makes me see all of my old work in a new light. And so it's hard to compare those two things. Um, that it's absolutely true in directing there is a, a massive amount of work that goes into understanding this overarching thing and then down every single level of detail to the smallest little when does this person lift their arm up sort of details um, <clears throat> but there's that same sort of work that goes into acting um, you as a director it's it's wonderful to work with experienced actors because they will come in having done a lot of work and gone farther into a character, hopefully, than you could think of as the director. And so they'll bring new things to it. And so hopefully you have actors who are doing that much work on top and, and it's hard to kind of compare which one's easier or harder. Um, but they all have to work with each other and so my favorite thing about stage managing always has been that you get to sit and watch the process. I sit in the rehearsal hall and take notes for the whole time. And uh, so, especially in this process, being able to watch Brad and Sarah and Jeff, who are old friends, work with each other was really cool because it's, it's almost as though um, it's not this director, actor, actor kind of thing. There's just three people who are creating this world together. Right, and it's a, it's a mutual, it's an environment of mutual support rather than a kind of dictatorial sort of I'm directing and you're doing what I say. So I, I uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of sharing that happens and that equalizes the workload as long as you're working with great people, which we were this whole process. And I have been for this whole year. <laughs> you talk. You have things to say. Uh. Yeah, um, well, I find directing terrifying. It, I'm sick to my stomach the entire time. Uh, I need um, an opening night. I feel um, like it's some kind of uh, strange universe in which everyone walks in and looks at my work. And I feel their beady little eyes judging it, and I can only see all the mistakes I've made. and. Um, it's absolute terror. Um, I enjoy it sometimes. I enjoy working with the actors. Uh, I enjoy some of the stagecraft, stage, staging, um, some of the staging. But if there's too many people, I do not enjoy it too much. Um, and that's what's so great about having Brad come in, because he's one of the rare exotic birds in the theater universe that actually likes it and knows how to do it. And that's a rare combination, too.
Like, it, he's smart enough to know how hard it is, and you know, and what, what it really takes to make it work, and he knows how to make it work. Um, where sometimes I go, uh, SOS, they would come in and help me. Um, and this role was um, terrifying as well. I, I feel like at the end of the night, I've gone through a 12 round fight with Mike Tyson in his prime. Um, I feel beat up, I feel, you know, exhausted. Uh, like, a, like there's a little bit of essence that's left on the stage where I don't, that I don't have anymore. Um, but that's the fight I love having the most of the two experiences. So it's a little bit, you know, that's the struggle I enjoy a little more. Um, you know, so the directing is, although, I, you know, again, I love being a director, I love working with my students. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about 99% terror. Um, although they don't know that during the process, I try to seem very calm. And then it comes out one day, I'm like, I don't know if we can do this, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, either something has to change, or, you know. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I remember when I was in college, my, uh, one of my professors was then going to take the lead role in Hamlet at, at UW, and everyone was like, oh, we gotta see him act, we gotta see him act. It was like, you know, a really big deal. And I, now thinking about it as somebody who teaches at, at Eastern, and, you guys both work here. Um, I wonder if there was any kind of pressure involved in um, that you teach acting, and I'm sure you do a little bit of acting anyway, as you teach, right, you're teaching acting classes, but um, if there was any pressure involved, or if you were just full on excited, and I mean, was it ever uh, scary or awkward? Like when you had to kiss sure. your students, for example? <laughs> yeah, everything you said. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. I mean, I mean, it's it's hard enough to play Eddie, you know, at any venue, in any circumstance. Uh, to do it with the idea of everyone, you know, here I take acting from this guy. Okay, now what are you gonna do with it? Um, you know, but I, you know, I just try to trust my scene partners, and luckily, you know, I you know, having worked with Sarah on the show is a great help, you know, because. Um, she just makes it easier up there, you know. And then um, the students that we had in our show uh, were all fantastic, and I really, we're always very professional. And, you know, I'm sure the thing that people would ask that question about the kissing scene a lot, and I can tell you it was one rehearsal. We did it, it was easy. And we never really had an issue, um, at least from my perspective. Um, you can choose to make it weird, or you can choose to do your job. And it was really cool to work with students that understood it was. It was just our job, you know. It's our job as storytellers. Um, and it's highly technical kissing on stage, by the way. It's not as glamorized as you think, um, especially in the middle of a combat sequence. Because a lot of it's like, okay, yeah, 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 like Cody, don't bump your knee here, and um, you know, just try to take a mint and <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a combat sequence. So, I don't, did you want to talk about this? Because from your perspective. Coming back to the stage? Anything? Sure. Um, okay, so what is, yeah, I mean, th this is just, I'll just share my most recent thought. I have always dealt with an, an extraordinary amount of stage fright. The kind that, you know, you vomit before and, and just wonder why in the world you'd ever put yourself through something like this. <laughs> And I, I had those moments in this play, totally had a breakdown in my office, and I was like, oh, this is terrible. Um, we, we have an 11 month old daughter, um, Maddie, Madeline, and for some reason, um, after opening night, a cherished colleague of mine, maybe you know her, Chris Vallejo, um, teaches in English. Does she teach in English? I think she's in here sometimes. Yeah. I'm not yeah. Sure. Well, she asked me about how my stage fright was, and I said, you know, it's kind of feels manageable right now. I don't, and, and I think it might be because I'm a mom now, and everything gets put into perspective, you know, and I probably can't measure the ways in which I'm different. And so my artist self, my sense of myself and that capacity uh, feels much more diminished than my, my mother, and when I go home, 
you know, Maddie has no idea where I've been. Luckily, her bedtime is before um, the babysitter comes. So my mom guilt was much lessened. I don't have time to think about it because I put her to bed and then run to the theater. So I know I'm talking a lot about this. It's very much in process. I was afraid to come today because we still have three performances and I really struggle articulating um, my, my work that I think is um, largely intuitive. Um, but in regards to my students, um, a great moment with, with Chris is, yeah, I, you know, I went up on my text. I had two experienced great difficulty memorizing that I hadn't really experienced before. Um, went up on my line, like, totally blanked. And, um, and so I was trying to think, is that sleep deprivation? You know, baby gets up at five. Is that just because my mind is so, you know, filled with all this stuff? But it was great because I just looked at him with that, I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> and, um, and, and he was phenomenal because he didn't take that moment as a student could have done, right? That, that sort of lower status, like, well, there's no way my teacher could have forgotten a line, so I'll just wait forever until she comes up with it, right? No, he jumped to the next cue, and I'm just like, oh, thank God, you know, not, you know, I just had such a tremendous faith. And I really feel that about everything, because that, um, and so I think that was part of it too, is that letting go of that sense of perfection, right? And maybe that's part of what this mother thing has been teaching me too, is I'm just so far from perfect, that it's okay to, I have to extend some grace to myself in all ways, and certainly on stage, you know. I think something interesting with talking about the pressure from the uh, on, on our professors here and our lectures and stuff and our teachers, but uh, it's from us. Uh, I think for some of us, we we were just really excited to see what they'd be like backstage. <laughs> you know, just just to kind of in a way, you know, as be on our level. You know what I mean? Like you're in our house. <laughs> you know, like, not that they haven't been there before. You know what I mean? It's just we hadn't seen that. You know, and uh, to be able to, to have backstage like, conversations where we're just goofing off, you know, or just easing that tension. Uh, there, there was a time where I'd come backstage and Sarah just hits me. No reason. <laughs> just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> just let it happen, you know. And then, you know, you just be able to goof off with each other and just have fun. And, and then you go out on stage and to know that uh, you're in good hands with each other like Jeff was talking about, to have good scene partners and to be there with them and, and we all respect our teachers very well and um, very much and the fact that we know we've got them too. So. I think it took a lot of guts. I mean, honestly, I think it was great that you did that and uh, the whole world gets to see and all your students get to see, you know, that you're not just that you're not just teaching them, but that um, you have the guts to to try too, you know. And and it's logistically so much harder when you have to teach and you have a family. And I mean, that to me um, is very impressive. So I mean, definitely applaud you guys for that. Um, I love this question. Thank you for giving me us an opportunity to reflect on this. Um, I I think it's also important to you know that. It is always a struggle. And the process in and of itself is not different than when I was 19, you know? And um, it is never easy. And it, to demonstrate anything other than that would be really dishonest, you know? And I think that any professional or career could relate to that. I don't I imagine sports, you know? And I just mentioned that because sometimes that's the most accessible sort of cultural thing, you know. Probably an NFL player doesn't say, oh yeah, it's a lot easier now that I'm in the NFL than it was when I was in college, you know. Well, there's probably a lot of student teachers in here even too, I mean, and, and that can be an experience in itself. There's a lot oh, of things yeah. that can be a stage, you know, where you have to put yourself out there. Well, and that's a lot of what we talk about is, is uh, going kind of back to that idea which I've said about being terrified all the time, that that fear can can halt your work, and it can make you stop and run away, or fear can drive your work, 
and it can keep you alive and moving forward. And I think that's, the, that's what we're talking about, is choosing to use fear as a driving force, rather than letting fear stand in our way of creating something. That sounds like some really dark shit. <laughs> <laughs> it can be, if you let it be. It's just about how you view it, yeah. Yeah, I had a question about interpretation. Um, just having read this screenplay, not having seen the performance. As a reader going through, I was having a hard time telling who the characters were versus how you perceive them. And I, I imagined that both Rodolfo and Catherine could be very different depending on how they were played. So how to decide which way to go, or is there like a, like a, you know, a standard that says if you do this play, you have to play this way? I don't know if there's a standard, but um, I mean, we also read it just like you guys had to. And uh, like he was saying with Eddie and with Miller specifically, the way he writes, it's all there. You have to find it. Sometimes you have to look and then relook and then relook again. But it's there. And it's, I mean, these people, to me, these people are real. And I mean, they won't ever be played the same way because it won't be Jeff's Eddie or uh, Sarah's Beatrice or Nicole's Catherine ever again. But it's, it's still, these people are real, and we pull them from the universe and embody them in a way. And so there's not really, you can tell when it's a lie. Like if I played Catherine different, you'd be, you could tell about it, it's a lie, you know? And I tried, too, on some parts, and I was like, oh, maybe if I just did like a little bit, I was like, no, icky. It's not real, I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know, so that's how I you feel about that. I think that plays are meant to be seen. You know, they're meant to be experienced. And in, uh, in reading them, Often, it is difficult to understand character and, and meaning and things like that. But when you put it on stage and you put it in bodies, that people automatically start to relate to each other in certain ways, as long as they're open to letting the text take them to certain places. Wasn't it clear when you guys saw it? Those readers saw it? It's amazing. If you think of a play as just, uh, sometimes this metaphor helps, I don't know if you want to know, but it's just uh, what you looked at and what you guys have looked at um, is just sheet music. Yeah. You know, and it's sheet music that you have not seen played yet. And what's so great about it, this art form is the individual expression of that sheet music. That's what makes John Coltrane John Coltrane, is because he plays it this way. He bends a note just far enough without breaking it in his way. Um, and so, yeah, that'll be a great discovery. You're, you're asking a great question, though, because um, that's a lot of the ambiguity that Miller steeped the play in, is how reliable is Eddie's perspective? Um, and he, you know, how, how reliable uh, is his point of view on Rodolfo? What is his feelings for Catherine? Is Rodolfo a weird or not, right? Um, and so, these are wonderful things that you can then go to the theater and have a discovery for yourself, and, and, and then you can walk away going, "Okay, yeah, I see that interpretation, and you know, maybe I thought it was this way still, or it could have been this way, this way, or whatever." But that's that's what a beautiful thing about theater is: it's a live connection, one night only, and it's done. Yeah. And next time you see the play, it'll be different. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, so this, this, the fact that you're asking that question means you're in a good place to, for the experience. Yeah. We, we had to make those discussions, though. You're right, in terms of theater's about choice and making choices. Um, so we had to make choices. We had to have at length discussions. I don't want to reveal them because, you know, um, it's just kind of showing you behind the curtain, you know. Uh, as an actor, do you find it harder to keep your composure from the, en uh, the energy your fellow actors will bring or from the reactions of the audience? Uh, for me, I, I love to make people laugh. And I have to make sure that I don't pander to that too much. I find it very difficult because I'm like, oh, they're laughing, yay, I'm funny. <laughs> Pay attention. Uh, uh, <laughs> But um, I think that uh, the energy that is given 
must be, you know, received and used. Uh, you can't act as a wall entirely. I think for me, I, I, never, I try never to just, somebody laughed and, you know, that's there. You know, but I, I take it in. I may not seem like I'm doing anything, but I take it in for me and take that little check mark now. It's like, all right, you know, now where's the character at? You know, where am I at? And I, when you embody that character, depending on the, the play or the situation you're in, you can use it directly or you can take it in with. And uh, last night was an interesting scenario where uh, I let Marco use it. And uh, when I entered, uh, normally I put my hand on Rodolfo's face after I cleaned him up a little bit. But I popped him right in the face. <laughs> and uh, it cut, cried a little laugh and it kind of made me, Marco smile like, I, I shape up, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I like to use it. But there is a consistency factor to it too that I like to think of. Because when you're on stage with your fellow actors, that you kind of go through similar emotions where you express things, it's always, you're always open for reaction and, and taking things in and then redistributing. The thing about the audience is that it's not always consistent. You, you have to play and you have to be ready for that, you know, because our opening night we had a smaller audience that was much more responsive than the initially and then last night it was kind of the opposite, you know, or a little bit less and so we had to, you have to work a little bit more to incorporate that fourth wall in the, the audience into it. I, I think that comparison is uh, super fascinating, actually, because uh, like Jeff said, the three, three ingredients for the theater, you have actors and audience and space, where you need actors and you need the audience. You need, you need all of that energy in order to, to create the work the way that we do. Um, and, and like I said, I, I have the privilege of watching the whole process, and it is, uh, what's really cool is watching an individual work a speech uh, just on their own, and then watching the way that that speech can develop when there's other people around them on stage and they can work off them, the way that it changes based on that energy, and then Finally, the way that the whole the whole uh, scene that's been created changes when we add an audience, and that energy is added. Our opening night show, for example, there was an immense reaction from the audience, which is oftentimes incredibly unexpected. We say things that you didn't know were funny before there was an audience there to laugh at it, and it's totally shocking. And. Uh, it, it, it can often completely take you off guard and you have to refocus yourself and put yourself back into the place. But you still have to accept that energy for the audience. We do things like holding for laughs and things so that the audience can hear everything. You have to be aware. Just in the same way that if an actor that you're with on stage blanks, you have to be alive and you have to be there in order to cover for them or help them get back on track. In that exact same way, you have to be ready for any reaction from the audience at all times. You have to be reading the energy and following that flow and riding the wave. It's really, it's a really cool experience. I'll take one. Yeah. Okay, so there's kind of this uh, really popular acting quote where they say acting is reacting. I'm not sure everybody's heard of that. Uh, and at least for me, you know, performing about an audience, when an audience does come in, it's sort of the guest performer in a way, because, you know, you're not looking at them, you're not saying lines to them, usually, but um, you, do, you do, like Tico was saying, you know, you feed off their energy, and the show's different because of that energy, and, you know, Lewis and Mike go out right at the beginning of the show, and we go off stage, we, we kind of know how the rest of the show is going to go. It's like, oh, all right, well, that's how they are. That's how the audience is. <laughs> and you get that feeling, and you're like, this is going to be awesome, or this is going to be less awesome than yesterday, you know, <laughs> or more awesome than yesterday. You know, it's, it's, it's different every show, but it's this sort of ethereal vibe you can pick up of something. You know, like some really shady guy walks into a bar, and you just sort of like, mm. it's that, but positive. <laughs> Maybe you guys can speak to uh, what, how people can get involved if they want to get involved, maybe next year. Or if there's something happening over the summer. I don't, I, usually there's some stuff happening over the summer. Come over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there will be auditions in the fall. Okay. Yep. 
all kinds of stuff. So first, um, you can take classes. I know that you probably don't have a lot of room in your you know, course study, but um, introductory performance classes, voice and movement, four days a week, you know, an hour, climb inside your body, and just um, be in a space without desks. It's really awesome. Uh, people from all disciplines take the class and really speak really highly of the experience. Not that they ever intend on being performers, but just that it gave them something that was meaningful. Uh, theater and the humanities, right? Um, stage painting, makeup, whatever interest that you have, we have a class. Um, and oftentimes the credits are very low. It's like a one credit makeup class on Fridays. So you can look and join us that way. Or you can just volunteer, right? We work in the costume shop, sewing, everything that you saw. I mean, few of the pieces were rented or pulled vintage, but also a lot was built. Um, so you could um, volunteer and develop really meaningful skills <laughs> that you know, you'll probably fix your homes because you learn how to use a bunch of tools. And I wish I had more practical skills like that. Um, so that's volunteer. Uh, and then there's, um, we, we actually hire. So if you had some experience in terms of construction or sewing, uh, then in the fall, we'll take applications. Uh, I virtually hire all work study and then um, interview for a select few paid positions that are non work study. So that's another avenue. And then we have auditions in the fall, um, usually for the, the fall quarter show. It's going to be To Kill a Mockingbird. Right? And so um, the very first week of school, we'll have an audition. And there were a lot of theater majors in this show, although there's a much bigger cast than our present here today. But um, that's not always the case. Had leads that have been like biology. And so it really is not an environment where, oh, you're not a theater major, so you won't get cast. So if you have any inclination, even to try it, had people who've never thought in a million years they could do it, and they just came to an audition and then did it. And what you see in the performance, right, is much different than what you see in an audition. As a director, I can tell you, most of the people that come to auditions, I think they can't read. Okay? <laughs> and so, I wouldn't worry too much about if you're going to make a fool of yourself. Um, you won't. So, there's that. In terms of this summer, we also have coursework. We have a, a voice coach who doesn't do, she is a singer, but she teaches speaking. And she coaches lawyers and doctors and, and public speaking people, but she also coaches on Broadway for Ethan Hawke and Kim Cattrall and all these great people. And she comes in and we do a, an acting intensive, like a boot camp, that's about four, that's four hours a night, uh, five days a week, four a month. So something really in depth. But I, I had a 16 year old, you know, Cheney kid in that class who's awesome, and I've had people who worked here in mathematics, faculty decided to take that. So people take performance classes for all different reasons. So that's an opportunity, first four weeks of summer. And then we're actually doing a collaborative production with Interplayers Professional Theater, which is located downtown Spokane on Howard Street. And we're doing a co-production of a, midnight, a Midsummer Night's Dream. So many of the people you see on stage will be in that production with the professional resident company at Interplayers. So that production is in um, late July and August. August 7th through the 17th. Okay, August 7th through the 17th. So <coughs> if you're around in the area, you can come see uh, Cherish the Play Midsummer. And probably so many other opportunities. There's student films that happen all the time. It's true. You know, and, and on and on and on and on. I, I don't, I just, I'd like to speak to what Sarah said there at the beginning really quick. I came in in the fall, uh, having very little theater experience. Uh, seriously, if you have any inclination of like, eh, this might be something I kind of want to try. These are the most welcoming people on the planet. So like, don't let fear stop you. So there might be one person in here who needed to hear that. But on his audition, first audition, he got a lead in a musical. Kinda. 
Yeah, I, we, we work with everybody. Um, I work in the scene shop, and I, I will take people with no experience at all. People who don't know how to use tools or have never picked up a drill, I will I'll teach you. I mean, it's a school. You know, I'll teach you how to do things. I'll teach you how to wire lights and how to build things. Poster design? Yeah, yeah, we do graphic design. We do costume construction. We do, I mean, it's like everything. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and we have awesome parties. <laughs> well, I mean, if that is. And, and you don't have to be a student to audition for the shows. If you, it's a community open yeah, school. Yeah. <laughs> there is priority casting for students, sure. but yes, it, the community is welcome to audition. All right. Yeah, we are at time, but if you have questions about getting involved, grab one of these people as they leave and ask them Talk to questions. Talk anybody, anyone at the theater. Yes. Thank you for coming.